Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Ahoy landlubbers, and welcome to episode 8. Paul and I are back and aboard the coal black bark, the happy delivery, with everyone's favourite cutthroat, Captain John Sharkey. Sink us for a pair of podcasters. After all the recent gothic horror, both on the podcast and in real life, we thought it best to lighten the mood with some stories about pirates and the high seas. So Paul, can you set the scene for us? Set in the early years of the 18th century, after the great wars of the Spanish succession had been brought to an end by the Treaty of Utrecht, the four-story saga of the notorious pirate Captain John Sharkey charts his brutal exploits throughout the Caribbean and beyond, including his near-fatal encounter with Sir Charles Ewan, the governor of St. Kitts, the double-dealing of the pirate-turned-sharkey hunter Stephen Craddock, the vengeful mission of the tragic Copley Banks, and the hidden terror of the Portobello, with its beautiful and insidiously deadly cargo. That's great. So, as you can tell, there are four Sharky stories in total. Um, The first three were actually published in 1897, the fourth in 1911. Um, So let's start with getting a bit of context to the writing and publication history. Uh, Conan Doyle appears to have started work on these in 1896. He had spent the beginning of 1896 in Egypt with his first wife, Louise, who was suffering from tuberculosis. And during this time, there was the Marxist revolt, and Conan Doyle was dragged in to become a temporary war correspondent for the Westminster Gazette. They then returned to the UK in May 1896, and it was around this time that Conan Doyle was working on his Napoleonic novel, Uncle Bernac, and started work on the tragedy of the Carrasco that was directly influenced by his travels in Egypt. And we have some tangential evidence that he may have been writing the Sharky Tales around mid-1896 because he actually wrote a a poem called A Rover Shanty, uh, which appeared in The Speaker, 27th of June, 1896. And three of the verses of that poem are then quoted within the third of the Sharky Tales. The Sharky stories were apparently a commission by Cyril Arthur Pearson, the owner of Pearson's magazine. Pearson had been George Noon's personal assistant at uh, Titbits magazine, the forerunner of The Strand, and had left in 1890 to create Pearson's Weekly, which ultimately went on to publish um, some great works, including The Invisible Man. Pearson's magazine was a sister monthly periodical that launched in January 1896, and uh, it was for Pearson's magazine that Conan Doyle was, was commissioned. Pearson's actually went on to publish uh, The War of the Worlds uh, and Kipling's Captain's Courageous in pretty much the same issues that the Sharky stories first appeared. Pearson actually would go on eventually to found the Daily Express newspaper, which unfortunately is still published today. The first three Sharky tales were then published in early 1897 uh, under the banner Tales of the High Seas, the governor of St. Kitts in January 1897, the two barks in March, and the voyage of Copley Banks in May 1897. There was actually a fourth title in the Tales of the High Seas series, uh, The Striped Chest, which appeared in Pearson's in July 1897. And it's a, a short tale about a booby trap treasure chest, which could easily have been a sharky story, but, but actually isn't. And then there's a big gap of 14 years before a fourth and final Captain Sharky tale was published, this being the the blighting of Sharky, again in Pearson's magazine in April 1911. But the stories go by uh, lots of different names, don't they, Paul? Uh, Yeah, um, you've given the the original names of the first three stories, but they appeared under various titles over the years. Uh, The Governor of St. Kitts, for instance, also appears as Captain Sharky, How the Governor of St. Kitts Came Home. 
The Two Barks appears as The Two Barks, The Dealings of Captain Sharkey with Stephen Craddock, or The Dealings of Captain Sharkey with Stephen Craddock. Uh, and The Voyage of Copley Banks is retitled later on How Copley Banks Slew Captain Sharkey, which is perhaps over-revelatory. <laughs> um, and you get all four of the stories gathered together uh, in Tales of Pirates and Blue Water in 1922, which appeared under the title The Dealings of Captain Sharkey and Other Tales of Pirates in the US. Um, but the also in the, the, in um, Tales of Pirates and Blue Water, the actual running order was changed so that you have the Governor of St. Kitts, the Two Barks, then The Blighting of Sharkey, the 1911 story, and then The Voyage of Copley Banks, which is another of the 1897 stories, to try and make some sort of chronological sense. But there's there's all sorts of mix-ups. If you read all four back-to-back, the, the chronology becomes as confusing as, as the Sherlock Holmes canon. Mm. And, and in fact, the biggest reason for the reversal of the last two stories is that apparently Sharky dies at the end of the third story. Mm, and uh, I mean, you could you would almost say of the of Sharky, it's, it's, it's you only die twice. <laughs> <laughs> So the obvious question to ask is why was Conan Doyle writing about pirates? And we've covered in previous podcasts the fact that he had a very strong interest in the stories of the sea, but he was also drawing on a very rich literary hinterland of of pirates in literature that you can date right back to um, Daniel Defoe's work, uh, Robinson Crusoe, 1719, Captain Singleton in 1720, and The King of Pirates in 1720, which were all written around the heyday of the pirates in the uh, in the West Indies. Yeah, just just to say, it, it's it's also interesting with with Daniel Defoe in, as well as his fiction. It's still an ongoing controversy about um, the, the the famous um, book by Captain Charles Johnson, a general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates, which was published in 1724. Um, and is usually attributed to uh, to Daniel Defoe, mm. but it, it's still not certain entirely whether mm. whether he was the author. But this, this book has been enormously influential and and really began to um, to, to to form the the popular picture of the pirate that we still have to this very day. And some of the incidents that are recounted in that general history we see reappearing in, in the Sharky Tales as well. They, they reappear throughout uh, much of pirate literature. Uh, Stevenson and Doyle, certainly both crib from, from Johnson. Mm. And in addition to Defoe, you have other writers like Conan Doyle references, including notably Walter Scott's The Pirate in 1822, which is based on the life of John Gow, um, who was featured in Johnson's general mm. history. You've got Marriott's The Pirate, um, in 1836, and you've got another great influence on Conan Doyle, Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote a short story in 1853, The Gold Bug, which uh, is is also uh, important for um, Conan Doyle aficionados in that that's a short story that popularised cryptograms and is often seen as a proto-detective story, but it's also an influence on one of uh, Conan Doyle's other great literary heroes, um, Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah, Stevenson, like Doyle, was, was a, a, a huge, um, huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, and and the, the the gold bug appeals at a number of levels. Obviously, the, there is the uh, the cryptogram element, but there's also the uh, the actual the buried treasure aspect, where mm. where Poe has picked up on the the famous story of of William Kidd and his his famous treasure, which was never found. Um, but you, you've also got Stevenson um, saying when the pirates on Treasure Island are, are, are actually on the trail of the treasure, the, there's a point where one of the signs is is uh, the skeleton of, of one of Captain Flint's pirates uh, has been left pointing the way to the treasure. And, and Stevenson himself um, said that that uh, he broke into the gallery of Mr. Poe and no doubt the skeleton in Treasure Island is conveyed from Poe. So th- one of the clues in, in the gold bug is, is, is a skull. And mm. uh, Stevenson has simply expanded this idea into a whole skeleton. Mm-hmm. And talking of Stevenson, that really brings us to the 1880s when there seems to be a huge renewal of interest uh, in in pirates in fiction. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, Stevenson's Treasure Island is is really um, one of the one of the catalysts of this. It's hugely popular. Mm. 
It was first published in the magazine Young Folks in serial form under the rather uninspiring title The Sea Cook, mm. uh, and then retitled Treasure Island uh, for, for, for its, its book release. And uh, it really, that title really nails the excitement and, and adventure element of the story perfectly. Uh, and and the whole sweeping romance of the, of, of the story, the, uh, the, 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 the this classic claustrophobic atmosphere of the Hispaniola sailing to the treasure island and then the mutiny and, and mm. all the excitement of, of that as well as the hunt for the treasure. Um, and at the centre of it all is, is this wonderful character, Long John Silver, who is... Um, the archetypal pirate. He's he's, he's one legged. He is is what what um, Conan Doyle said of of um, Robert Louis Stevenson. It might be remarked that he is the inventor of what may be called the mutilated villain. Mm. And, um, Silver is is the absolute epitome of this. But he's also a hugely interesting character in that he's, he's very violent and very dark. But he's also hugely likable and personable, and he has this this very charismatic side to him. And you, you can't help but side with him at times that's a very good point and i th- i think that's one of the things that when we come into the stories a bit more we can see that conan doyle um almost rejects the kind of romanticism of pirates that you see in um treasure island uh, treasure island itself has a slightly more romantic view of 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 pirates even though there are moments of terror and and, and horror in there there oh, is it's a, a very, very violent book. It is very violent. But you get the sense that Silver could be on the path to redemption at some point, whereas I think with Sharky, he's only going one way. Well, with, with one of Stevenson's later novels, The Master of Ballantrae, published in 1889, which is mm. is really more, you put it in the uh, the, the Jacobite genre of, of novels yeah but it does have a pirate episode where the um the master uh, of ballantrae himself james dury uh, and and uh, an irish soldier of fortune the chevalier de burke uh, fall in with a gang of pirates and um burke writes uh, of, of of their captain their leader was a horrible villain with his face blacked and his whiskers curled in ringlets teach his name a most mm-hmm. notorious pirate. He stamped about the deck, raving and crying out that his name was Satan and his ship was called Hell. There was something about him like a wicked child or a half-witted person that daunted me beyond expression. What kind of pandemonium that vessel was, I cannot describe, but she was commanded by a lunatic and might be called a floating bedlam. And this is more the school of pirate literature that that uh, that conan doyle's tapping into in many ways with 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 captain sharky yeah very good very good point and that reminds me of another possible direct influence on conan doyle's um approach to the captain sharky stories which is the the story um tom kringle's log uh which appeared in serialized form in blackwoods in 1829 and we know that conan doyle had read quite a lot from blackwoods magazine may even have had copies at uh, at home or, or at stonyhurst um, and Tom Kringle's log is the story of a young man who is um, diminutive stature and models himself on Nelson, and he joins the Navy. And the story is essentially a series of incidents and inv- adventures involving mutineers, storms, and pirates, and it's interspersed with uh, descriptions of uh, shore life and customs set during the Napoleonic Wars and, and the War of 1812. And it's in Chapter 2 that Tom encounters... Uh, pirates that have taken a London merchantman and after the Tom and his compatriots defeat the pirate crew they discover a captain tied to the table um, with his throat cut so savagely that uh, he's almost decapitated Um, and that actual setting of the captain tied to the table reappears in the Sharky stories there's a prosperous man who's hysterical with fear and his his wife has been raped by the pirates she's mad with shame and fright and uh, there's an aside that says that she spent her last days in an asylum. I mean, it's a really lurid and uh, and, and vicious book. And, and in um, his magisterial account of literature and his literary influences through The Magic Door in 1907, Conan Doyle actually refers directly to this story and says, I hope boys respond now as they once did to the sharks and the pirates, the planters, and all the rollicking high spirits of that splendid book. Um, which just goes to show what sort of things he enjoyed as a child. And what it went I on still to probably enjoyed. Absolutely. 
absolutely. Um, and on a sort of slightly lighter note, thinking about what else was in the in the ether in the 1880s, uh, alongside Ballantrae and, and Treasure Island, you actually have Gilbert and Sullivan. It's the Pirates of Penzance is first performed New Year's Eve 1879, and it really pokes fun at the grand opera uh, conventions. The pirates in this case are tender-hearted orphans who capture the famous Major General um, and the pirates later learn that they are all descended from peers, I think, um, to which the Major General bids them resume your ranks and legislative duties and take my daughters, all of whom are beauties. <laughs> so let's come on to explore the stories themselves and the logical place to start is with, with Captain Sharkey himself. Sharky himself is a very interesting character, and and in his his um, delineation, uh, Conan Doyle in many ways goes against the uh, the rules of the, the crusty salty sea dog that mm. um, that Stevenson uses in uh, in, in in Treasure Island and, and Ballantrae. In his very physical appearance, uh, he, he's described in The Blighting of Sharky as a very different figure was Captain John Sharky. His thin, drawn, clean-shaven face was corpse-like in its pallor, and all the sons of the Indies could but turn it a more deathly parchment tint. He was part bald, with a few lank locks of tow-like hair and a steep, narrow forehead. His thin nose jutted sharply forth, and near set on either side of it were those filmy blue eyes, red-rimmed like those of a white bull terrier, from which strong men winced away in fear and loathing. His bony hands with long, thin fingers, which quivered ceaselessly like the antennae of an insect, were toying constantly with the cards and the heap of gold moradors which lay before him. His dress was of some sober drab material, but indeed the man who looked upon that fearsome face had little thought for the costume of its owner. Um, what you've got here, it, it, it's not kind of the big, burly, heavily bearded, mm. um, you know, blackbeard type character of popular myth. You've got someone who's who's almost small and insignificant, uh, and almost you know, like a like a, a an undead figure mm. um, in in the way he's described. So he really doesn't uh, fit in with 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 the stereotype. There's also from that the the fact that Sharky seems to originate from from a, a higher social background. Um, for example, in in the first story, he's able to pass himself off as a a, a British governor. Mm. Um, so he, he he again he's not this all shouting, all swearing, classic pirate in 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 that sense. He he can do that. Mm. Um, but he has this 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 other side to him. The, 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 there's there's something about him that that, that you, you you can't quite capture. Mm, he's very counter type. I think you're right. Mm. And, and also mm. he and that whole physical appearance. I mean, when I was rereading them recently, I was really struck by this this business about him having a sort of nasal tones and high high neighing laugh. And you know, if you were trying to cast him. I would have put Kenneth Williams in that character, which is, <laughs> you know, not your traditional view of a pirate at all. Um, but he's um, he so he also has strange things like he wears very heavy, heavy linen and hats and things that actually, you know, under under the beating hot Caribbean sun. So you know, he he, as you say, does come across very much as being undead um, mm, mm. in his personification of Sharky, uh, Conan Doyle was, was certainly going against type of, of um, the pirate in popular culture of, of, of his own late ni- 19th century times. Hmm. Um, but Sharky, in, in many ways, if he, he is this more gentlemanly character in, in that sense. He, he fits into the, the historical pirate captain in, in, in some ways, um, where you've got... Captains like uh, Henry Avery, known as Long Ben, or Edward England, Bartholomew Roberts, Black Bart, Steed Bonnet, and George Lowther, were all more uh, gentlemanly characters. Uh, mm. the, 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 the whole thing seems to have, have changed with the advent of, of Edward Teach, yes, uh, uh, Blackbeard, and that's where we really get this 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 kind of what we think of as 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 the classic pirate captain um but in many ways he was a, an aberration yes and it might well be that this is further indication of of conan Doyle's commitment to historical accuracy in that he does seem to have done his background research 
for this. I mean, almost certainly read Johnson's A General History of Pirates because of the number of incidents that repeat. But you you also get, you know, direct references to some of those sources. Steed Bonnet comes up in Copley Banks. And in fact, you know, the, the, that third tale, Copley Banks, is in many ways a retelling of the case of Steed Bonnet, a, a respectable individuals who, who descended into piracy and uh, eventually joined forces with um, with Blackbeard. And it's notable, I think, that the beginning of each of the Sharky tales begins with a, a bit of a history lesson. It begins with something where Conan Doyle is either explaining the rules of pirates or um, the uh, advent of piracy from the buccaneers or even down to things like the the process of careening a ship. Um, there, there is a strong commitment to historical accuracy here that you get in a way that's, you know, often lighter than you see in his other historical fiction. Mm, he, he's very interested in 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 almost like the 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 three stages of of, of piracy, where you you begin with with the privateers, the the Henry Morgans, mm. uh, and then you have their transformation into into the buccaneers. Mm. Um, and and then finally the the pirates the real sea rovers. Uh, I mean, in in the Governor of St Kitts, he, he writes on the Coromandel coast at Madagascar in the African waters, and above all in the West Indian and American seas, the pirates were a constant menace. They were the more to be dreaded because they had none of that discipline and restraint which had made their predecessors, the buccaneers, both formidable and respectable. These Ishmaels of the sea rendered an account to no man and treated their prisoners according to the drunken whim of the moment. Mm. And it's that commitment to historical accuracy and almost a resistance to romanticising the pirates and their deeds that leads to quite a lot of brutality in the, the Sharky stories. That doesn't, you, know, you don't see much in the way of direct horror, um, but a lot of reported incidents, all of which are, are pretty blood-curdling. Yes, we have um, certain incidents uh, ascribed to Sharky. Uh, we, ha- we have, for, for instance, in the blighting of Sharky, we have one of his, his crew members say that they know you killed Jack Bartholomew the carpenter by beating his head in with a bucket so that each of us goes in fear of his life. And, and this is based on a, an incident in 1697 when, when William Kidd killed one of his, his gunners, William Moore, by striking him over the head with, with a wooden bucket. Mm. And, this, and also, I think, in that same one, Sharky is known to have uh, fired guns at his crew members underneath the table at dinner, um, just to sort of liven it up, which I think was something ascribed to, um, to Blackbeard. Yeah, I think this again comes from from Johnson, and and Blackbeard is is supposed to have done this, and and it caused um, the the pirate Israel Hands to lose his leg. Mm. Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, there's also almost a shocking casualness mm. about the, the the violence within these stories. Again, in the blighting of Sharky, when Sharky's crew capture the uh, the, the the merchant ship, the Portobello. Um, and simply get all the passengers and crew to step off into into the to, to to drown in the sea one by one, but as they step off, one of Sharky's crew hamstrings them with a cutlass to make sure they can't swim to safety anyway. Mm. Mm. And um, little things like uh, um, individuals having their lips served up to them with pepper and salt on the plate, <laughs> or their noses split. Slit open, I think. Mm. It's quite quite astonishing. I mean, he, mm. that really does go back to Tom Kringle's log and the sort of, <laughs> yeah, absolute delight in all of those uh, all of those moments. Um, and a lot of the violence is, as we said, reported off screen. One of the things that's really interesting about Captain Sharky as a character is that he often isn't the focus of the story. So in the first adventure, uh, the Governor of Saint Kitts. The main character really is Captain John Scarrow. In the second one, it's Craddock, and in the third, it's it's Copley Banks. And there's a particularly interesting thing with, I think, Stephen Craddock in the second story and Copley Banks in the third, in that they're almost the same characters reversed. Um, in the case of Stephen Craddock, this is a, a, a villainous man who has been redeemed, and now a Puritan is... Um, is trying to essentially uh, um, save his soul by using the old tricks of his trade to 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 capture Sharky and ultimately falling foul of of Sharky's brilliance. Um, and Copley Banks is the opposite. It's a tragic case 
Copley Banks of uh, a man whose wife and daughter were murdered by Sharky and though a respectable individual himself he actually turns to piracy to beat Sharky at his own game and in that way there's almost a sense in which the the brutality and the horror of uh, the pirates in the Sharky tales it, it, it's an infection it spreads to other people around notably Copley Banks himself who who ultimately descends to a form of madness to be able to bring um, Sharky to his reckoning. Yeah, and, and you actually, um, it's, it's very interesting at the end of that story where you have no idea what happens to Copley Banks afterwards. No. You just have him and his his accomplice, another victim of, of Sharky, heading off into, into the jungles. Mm. And, you know, are they going to die in there or, or are they going to, uh, have they gone so far down the line that they're, they're he's going to become the new Sharky? Yes, absolutely. Um <laughs> And it's probably worth pointing out at this time that you know one of the reasons why the uh, uh, the third and fourth stories are are often reversed um, in collections was because at the end of the third story, at the end of Copley Banks, Copley Banks actually succeeds um, apparently, and Sharky meets his demise. Um, with, yes, with his, his ship and his entire crew. Absolutely, and yet you know, fourteen years back later, he's back in the blighting of Sharky. Uh, well, one of the interesting points with that as, as, as well is is the fact that you um, you suddenly have in the blighting of Sharky two two of Sharky's crew members are actually two of Copley Banks' former crew members who apparently got blown up in this this great explosion. Yes. It's, it's very very confusing. It is. It is really. I mean, I, I have to say, of the four stories, um, the fourth one for me is the least successful. And part of the reason for that is that I think um, it starts with Sharky as the main character. You know, he's the main focus of that story right from the beginning. It starts with him in his cabin being confronted by members of his crew who said that he's no longer doing uh, a, a good job. Um, mm. And as much as it's an entertaining story and it unfolds and it's got a nice twist in it, um, Sharky to me feels almost a bigger character, a more effective character when you hear of his desperate deeds off screen and he he suddenly appears later the opening of the governor of st kitts really focuses on captain scarrow and his crew fully expecting that there is going to be news of sharky as soon as as soon as they arrive mm. they even have a bet on the fact that the first words of the um uh, the portmaster coming up the side is is going to include uh, some reference of some kind to, to sharky he's that notorious but then, in, again, late, as as the story progresses, uh, one of the, the the most interesting aspects of it uh, is that Sharky is there throughout the story, and mm. we don't realise it. Mm. Yeah, and it, it, it's a it's a it's a lovely little twist, and that probably brings us a bit onto onto the mechanics of the of these short stories uh, as well, because I, we often talk of Conan Doyle as a master of the short story. I think you really do get a sense of that within these these tales certainly in terms of his speed of establishing characters there's a great character sir edward compton in um the second one in the stephen craddock story who is uh regarded as a a rather upstanding anglican governor um and he's faced with this puritan who had gone wrong in his sense and and is now being sort of redeemed and and there's some great lines in there just to establish edward compton uh, as a character uh, for example sir edward uh, received stephen craddock with little enthusiasm for in spite of some rumors of conversion and reformation he had always regarded him as an infected sheep who might taint the whole of his little flock and later uh, there's that wonderful line uh, when confronted with craddock um sir edward compton cocked his episcopalian nose at him <laughs> Um, so you get this rapid establishment of characters. You also get this brilliant um, control of of the plot mechanisms as well. And each of the stories has got some form of of twist within it. And um, as much as you can look back on the first one, in particular the Governor of St Kitts, and think, well, you know, it's fairly obvious what's going on there. I don't think it really is that obvious it, when you it read isn't. it the first time. You know, there's something not quite right. Mm. But you 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 can't put your finger on it exactly. Mm. Um, when it does come, you're not at all. Oh, that's it, of course. But as you're reading it, um, you, you don't. You just know that there's something going on that you can't quite grasp. Mm. 
Mm. And in that, you're in the same position of Captain Scarrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, and another possible uh, Stevensonian influence um, on the on the Sharky saga is is the way that the, the Conan Doyle uses crew members, and and or they all have these these classical piratical names. Mm. Um, you've got, you've got Ned Galloway, who is uh, Sharky's quartermaster. Um, and Owen Dudley Edwards in in the quest for Sherlock Holmes has has, has seen within the name Ned Galloway. He's seen hidden uh, the name Ned Lowe, who was um, Captain Edward Lowe, who who was uh, historically captain of, of of the Good Fortune, um, mm. which o- Owen thinks may have influenced the name the Happy Delivery. Um, there is another school of thought with the Happy Delivery that um, Doyle may have have heard of a a Royal Africa Company vessel called the Gambia Castle, uh, which was taken over by a mutinous crew led by George Lowther in 1721. Um, She, in the hands of her mutinous crew, uh, she was then renamed the Delivery and and turned pirate. Mm. Um, One of the other crew members on, on the Happy Delivery is Israel Martin, the bosun. Um, that name probably came from the um, historic pirate uh, Israel Hands, who also makes an appearance in Treasure Island and is uh, is shot off the mainmast by Jim Hawkins. Mm. Um, you've got the improbably named Birthmark Sweetlocks, <laughs> um, who is the uh, the master of the Happy Delivery and, and uh, leads the mutiny in the blighting of Sharky. Um, uh, there's the gunner, Red Foley, which is interesting because Foley, of course, was uh, Conan Doyle's mother's name. Oh, yes, good spot. Um, so it's a little family name bobbed in there. Um, or the, the the surgeon, Sharky's surgeon, Baldy oh. Stable. Baldy Stable. Who is a, a gentleman surgeon who's turned pirate for, and this is an interesting phrase, misusing a patient. Oh, my in goodness. Charleston, uh, which could cover any number of sins. I like the uh, the description of a bloated fat man he was with a creased neck and a great shining scalp which gave him his name. But he's a, so he's also a naughty GP. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> One suspects the patient he misused was probably female. Indeed. Gosh. Mm. Um, it's, it's again to, to come back to Ned Galloway as well. It's it, it's um, interesting that 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 he is um, depicted as as a New England Puritan. Mm. Um, which again is is the same sort of character background as um, Stephen Craddock. Yes, and we've been saying all the way through that uh, Stevenson is a profound influence on Conan Doyle uh, generally, but particularly in the Sharky stories. He's positively effusive about Treasure Island in Through the Magic Door, and um, part of Through the Magic Door is actually a reworking of an earlier article Conan Doyle wrote called Mr. Stevenson's Methods, of fiction, which was published in 1890. And that article is really interesting in that it, it highlights three things that I think you can see reflected in in Conan Doyle's treatment of, the, of these pirate tales. The first is that he talks about the importance of historical accuracy in Stevenson's work. And he actually cites there the difference between um, Kidnapped and Treasure Island. Uh, he says, uh, Treasure Island is the better story. While I could imagine that Kidnapped might have the more permanent value as being an excellent and graphic sketch of the state of the Highlands after the last Jacobite insurrection. So there's there's um, an interesting thing there where Conan Doyle is again revealing his, uh, his preference for historical fiction and how historical fiction is, uh, is, is the hallmark and what you should aspire to. But also the fact that he's referring there to historical accuracy in, in Stevenson's works. Uh, the second thing that he he actually cites is the fact that uh, Stevenson's great at establishing characters indirectly, which is exactly what we talked about with with Sharky being a character who is uh, largely presented off screen. Conan Doyle writes of Stevenson: "Observe how the strong effect is produced in the case of uh, um, Long John Silver, uh, seldom by direct assertion on the part of the storyteller, but usually by comparison, innuendo." Or indirect reference. So by a touch here and a hint there, there grows upon us the individuality of the smooth-tongued, ruthless, masterful, one-legged devil. And then the third thing he points out is natural dialogue or realism, which we've we've also touched on. Um, he says, uh, 
Uh, and the buccaneers themselves, how simple and yet how effective are their little touches which indicate their ways of thinking and of acting. And those three things, the historical accuracy, establishing character indirectly, and natural dialogue and realism, just lifts off the page in the in the, the Sharky stories. It feels very much like Conan Doyle is taking these rules that he's uh, he's taken from Stevenson and applying them into practice to great effect. Yeah, to to perfection, and and, and provides a, a, a model himself. Mm. I mean, it it is interesting what he he, he says there with with uh, when comparing kidnapped and, and Treasure Island. Mm. And you could almost say you know, yes, kidnapped is certainly the more important book in the in the literary historical sense, but. Treasure Island is more important in in a cultural sense. Mm, very much so. Another thing that that comes out in these stories, particularly from the um, the, the, the historical background, is the, this uh, a constant use of doubling and disguise throughout the the, the, the four stories. Mm. Um, I mean, you you start with 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 Conan Doyle's description of the historical pirates. So you're going from privateers to buccaneers to pirates. Historically speaking, this is a, a, a figure who can transmute mm. and appear in different forms. Um, and, and throughout the, the stories, the first time we meet Sharky, he's in disguise. He 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 appears as somebody else, um, as does his quartermaster Ned Galloway, who appears in the character of a shipwrecked mariner. Mm. Uh, rather than ruthless pirate, you've got this with with as as you've alluded to with with Stephen Craddock, who is is um, poacher turned gamekeeper, yeah, uh, and then Copley Banks, who turns from from a uh, a good merchant into a pirate himself for his own reasons. Um, so you have this this constant moving of of character, this constant characters appearing as somebody else. And you've even got it to an extent in the um, the, the, the Stephen Craddock story, uh, where he takes the um, the Happy Delivery sister ship, the White Rose, and paints it black to disguise it as the Happy Delivery mm. to fool Sharky. So this is this constant movement of character and appearance, and 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 it it, it just gives the stories a, a wonderful edge of uncertainty. That's a really good point. And that nicely takes us on to think about some of the other fictions that appear around this time, um, which may have been influenced by uh, Conan Doyle's work, uh, but certainly continue that interest and fascination with pirates. Uh, You have um, the work of Raphael Sabatini, uh, which is uh, a bit later, sort of 1915 onwards. And then you have uh, Emilio Salgari, who wrote uh, The Black Corsair in 1898, uh, which is really um, set in the Caribbean in the Golden Age of piracy around the same time as um, the, the the Sharky tales. You also have uh, his Sandakan novels, uh, which uh, he wrote over a 30-year period, which is set in South China Sea. It's much more of a sort of strains of Orientalism and Imperial Gothic in, in those. Um, and some other notable writers, I mean, probably one of the most notable there is William Hope Hodgson's The Ghost Pirates in 1909. Yeah, Hodgson is a particularly interesting example. Um, uh, another great writer on 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 the sea, but adding the, the, the a twist of of horror um, and and often very sort of what what Lovecraft would term the cosmic horror in into these stories. Uh, and the, the Ghost Pirates is is particularly uh, it, it's the the insidiousness of the story is is, is wonderful as, mm. as this ghost ship attaches itself. To a to a surface vessel, and and gradually takes it over. Um, uh, and it, it, it's it's almost uh, if you, if you look at it in 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 a, in a sort of cultural terms, you could say that this is the the cultural influence of of the pirate made real. The 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 the, the cultural ghostliness of the pirate becomes actual ghostliness uh, in in this story. Mm. You actually have another connection to a sort of ghostly pirate in. Um in the rather less successful Clark Russell story, The Frozen Pirate, <laughs> in 1887, which is uh, essentially about a, um, a pirate who has been cryogenically frozen and is then defrosted and tells his tales. Um, and, uh, but, well, it might have been one of those um, fine sea stories that Watson was enjoying in the Five <laughs> Orange Pips, and, uh, and it might well not have been. Um, but, but also appearing around this time, between the first three Sharky Tales and uh, and the Blighting of Sharky in 1911, you have uh, 
probably one of the most famous uh, pirate um, adventures with a strong connection to Conan Doyle, and that's the um, the emergence of Peter Pan by Barry. Yeah, Peter Peter Pan in the figure of, of Captain Hook just just takes all all the tropes. Uh, you, you've got the, uh, the the gentleman pirate. He, he's an old Etonian, which is quite wonderful. <laughs> um, and he, he was he appears and was depicted in in the the flowing red coat and and the the, the big Ramillies wig uh, of of the type that um, that Sharky wears in in the first of the stories. Mm. Um, and and you've also got, of course, with 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 the hook, the Stevensonian mutilated villain. Yes, it, it, it's all there. Mm. Very much so. And many of these examples are, are writers who are tapping into this same milieu. Um, I think there's one writer who we might say is a bit more influenced directly by Captain Sharkey, and that's um, Russell Thorndike, who wrote um, the uh, Dr. Sin novels, um, the first of which appeared in 1915, four years after the blighting of Sharkey. And uh, Thorndike wrote seven novels in total. Uh, between 1915 and uh, 1944. Um, and the first novel, Dr. Sin, A Tale of the Romney Marsh, introduces uh, Dr. Christopher Sin, S-Y-N, Parson of Dimchurch, who uh, it, it is secretly a dread pirate and smuggler. And it was then um, adapted by, uh, by Hammer, uh, as a as, as a great movie, Captain Clegg in 1962. Uh, yeah, and and um, while at the the, the the same time as as Russell Thorndike is is perhaps lifting ideas and and tropes from the the, the, the Sharky stories and 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 their ilk. Uh, you've also got in the 1930s a, a growth of, of of pirates in in children's literature. Mm. Um, so well, one of the um, main examples is 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 John Maysfield, who'd actually written an historical work on on piracy uh, in 1925 called On the Spanish Main. Oh yes. Um, but he introduces um, piratical characters, piratical rats, mm. in into um, his his children's novels, The Midnight Folk in 1927, um, and and The Box of Delights in 1935. Mm, yeah. yeah, the wonderful crew of pirate rats uh, and. And then they're, they're Captain Rum Chops. <laughs> <laughs> also in the 1930s, in the, well, 1930 itself, uh, Arthur Ransom um, published the first uh, Swallows and Amazons, in, in mm. which um, the Amazons, uh, Nancy and Peggy Blackett, uh, identify themselves with the with the, with the classic image of the, of the pirate with the. Uh, the bandanas and the uh, flying the Jolly Roger from their their ship on on, on Coniston Water. Mm. Well, we've covered a lot of ground and touched on many aspects of of these stories. And you know, we started the podcast relatively flippantly about uh, these being rather fun throwaway stories about um, the pirates and the high seas. But I sense there's a bit more to them than that. Yeah, there's a real element of of historical atmosphere about these stories and. Um, it, it's quite clear that, that Conan Doyle had done quite a bit of research mm. uh, before he started writing. They're, they're, they're not just throwaway, you know, almost children's stories or, or, or tales of, of high adventure on the high seas. There is study of character in these stories. There, there is uh, a study of, of the pirate as, as a cultural and historical figure. Um, and... It, it sounds a bit grand, but almost a study in, in the character of, of, of almost evil at times. Yes, in, in Sharky, the, 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 these these aren't just 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 throwaway stories, but they, they are they, they are fun to read. Mm. But there's, there's definitely um, more going on than than just just um, light adventure stories with 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 a, a a brush of violence about them. Yeah, I agree entirely, and. I think if people have not necessarily read the Sharky stories before or indeed read much Conan Doyle outside of um, perhaps the Sherlock Holmes stories, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised to read the Sharky tales, particularly the first three, I think, um, because they really do show his genius as a short story writer in so many different ways. Uh, and it, it's it's another one of those classic examples with Conan Doyle of, of, of the, the dangers in in 
writing so widely uh, and so well on, on 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 a number of different subjects is that the these stories have possibly because there are only four of them um being been overlooked and um in in when one is thinking of of the, the general sort of cultural history of pirates conan doyle doesn't really ca- come into the discussion mm. but definitely and he should yeah but definitely mm. made some some contribution i think mm. we can be we can be uh, we can be sure of that so that brings us to the end of episode 8 you can find the show notes at the website uh, doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doings of doyle on twitter um, and we hope to be back very soon with a festive edition of the podcast Yes, everybody associates Conan Doyle and Christmas with the Blue Carbuncle. We're going to do something slightly different uh, and explore one of his stories from the early 1880s called An Exciting Christmas Eve, or my lecture on dynamite. So we'll be back with you very soon indeed. Until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. His thin, drawn, clean-shaven face was corpse-like in its pallor, and all the sons of the Indies could but turn it to a more deathly parchment tinge. What the heck did I say there? Tinge? <laughs> tinge. <laughs> What's know. tinge? I've no idea. I'll, deathly, I'll, I think we've got our outtake. <laughs> deathly parchment tinge. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.